are listening to the Marketing and Yoga Pants podcast, a podcast in sisterhood for female entrepreneurs that serves up savvy, actionable marketing advice and interviews with creative business owners who are in the trenches building their businesses as we speak. The Marketing and Yoga Pants community is for you, the girl on her couch, in her yoga pants, top knot tight, hunched over her MacBook, trying her hardest to get the word out about her business. So in the name of supporting each other while supporting ourselves, bringing community, sound marketing advice, coffee, chocolate, and wine together for you, yoga pants wearing business owner, in a world where followers mean nothing but paying customers mean the world, Join us on this week's podcast episode and in our private Facebook group where you'll meet your soul sisters and build your business in yoga pants. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Marketing in Yoga Pants podcast. I'm Britt Colo and I'm here today with Christy Rice, founder of Momental Design. Thank you so much for joining me today, Christy. Well, thank you for having me. So this one's a little different. You might notice in the audio, you may, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you're watching this on YouTube or the video, you definitely know this is a little different. We are doing a live podcast episode here, recording live. We've got a small audience uh, of a few of our members in our local chapters, Rising Tide Society. They're here, they're hanging out with us. Uh, we've got some of the, our, the members' kids in the background. They're kind of hanging out with us too. So this is going to be a fun one. Um, but I am uh, interviewing and speaking with Christy today to get an insight into her business, what it's been like to grow it and build it, and what she's what she's got her hands in right now. So I'm so pumped to have her here, get some insight into all of that. So Christy, you ready to jump in? Sure. Awesome. Let's do this. So first of all, tell me about how you earn your living right now. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> big question. That's I know. Big question. Okay, so I am the founder of Momental Designs, uh, which began in 2003, and it grew from just me at my dining room table to now we have nine employees full time um, that work for us, and so that is definitely my bread and butter. That is that's where it's at. Um, so we create hand painted stationery. We work with couples all over the world primarily. Um, we do have a local following, but it is small. So, <laughs> um, and we do, um, you know, special event stationery for sure. Weddings, you know, um, that kind of thing mostly. Uh, but we do commissioned artwork. Um, we do branding for small boutique style businesses. Um, now on the more personal side, uh, I do licensing, artwork licensing and license with a bunch of different brands. I'm actually about to sign on with an art rep to kind of get more work in that, in that avenue of things. Um, and I'm also an author. So um, I just revealed the cover of my eighth book with Schiffer Publishing yesterday. So that's kind of fun. Yeah. That's super fun. That's, <laughs> that's exciting. And I, uh, I love going into these interviews not knowing a ton about the person I'm talking to. Uh, I kind of have an idea, but I love to know. I love to get it firsthand. So, And I kind of gathered that you had some books under your belt, but that's super exciting. I really want to dive into that. So, all right. So being that really design is your thing. Uh, and you're running this business, lots of things going on. I mean, nine people on your team, that's yeah. a lot of people. Uh, so tell me the story of how you came to do this with your life. My goodness. Well, I think my story as a stationer is pretty much like a lot of others where, you know, I was getting married in 2000 and I wanted something different for my own stationery and I couldn't find it. I think we've all heard that story um, from other stationers, but it's the truth. You know, that's where a lot of great ideas come from. It's a, just a, a lack or a need for something in the marketplace. And so that's where it really started. I created my own stationery and I would never show it to you right now because it's so bad. It was bad. I loved it back then, but it's bad. Um, <laughs> Uh, I created my own stationery. I really loved doing it. Um, after my wedding was over, 
it was a way for me, like, I didn't have the, like, post-wedding blues like a lot of brides do. Like, what do I do now? I'm bored. I don't have DIY projects anymore. I didn't have that because I had started doing the stationery for friends, word of mouth. At that point, it was very, very localized, the work that I was doing. Uh, my original goal when I started was to be known in Northeast Pennsylvania and New York as like the stationer. That was my goal. And I had never thought globally at all. Um, but I built my own website from the get go. I didn't have enough money to invest in even a couple thousand dollar website. I just didn't. Mm -hmm. And so I built it in a very antiquated program that doesn't even exist anymore. Microsoft front page. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I learned how to code, and I learned all of that fun stuff, which to this day is still extremely helpful. And I started getting hits from all over the country and the world. Um, I was showing up in organic searches very quickly. Um, I figured out SEO, and I just kind of made that all happen. And so what went from a very, like, localized dream quickly turned into kind of this, like, nationwide dream that I didn't even actually dream for myself. Like I didn't think it was possible. Um, you know, so this was back in like 2003, 2004. Um, and so I just kept going and I kept taking the work that was coming in. I was working full time as, um, a manager at Bath and Body Works with the limited corp. <laughs> I had a degree in art education, but I couldn't use it for countless reasons. Um, and so I was doing a lot of visual merchandising with the limited corp. That's what it turned into, which I actually liked. And I liked working with people, but I was working, eventually working two full-time jobs. I was working momental all by myself and, you know, going to my nine to five. And so things really started to evolve around 2008. Um, got our first feature in the knot in 2009, which I had no idea was coming, um, and that really propelled us to a point where I started hiring, you know, friends and just testing the waters with payroll and having a team and starting slowly. Um, I did not take any loans out. To this day, I still haven't taken any loans out. Um, it, I didn't have investors. Mm -hmm. Um I'm a big proponent of slow growth. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's a lot of consultants out there that would say, nope, go with that dream and dive in all the way and, and you know, get investors and take loans out and jump in. But I am much more of a um, slow and steady type mm -hmm. of gal. <clears throat> so, um, but yeah, it, it, was, it was definitely a slow evolution um, where I just kind of, you know, the dream that I had for myself originally just blossomed into something completely different and just blows my mind every day still that I'm here and doing it. That's, uh, man, that's a lot. And I, I could dive into that. No, that's, a, no, it's perfect. Uh, I could dive into so many pieces and I feel like I could ask you questions all day long because that's an amazing story. So tell me, how long were you working full time and running Momental? Um, okay, let's see. Wow. I'm going to show my age here. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So I started Momental in 2003 while I was living in New York mm -hmm. and I was working retail at that point, moved back to Pennsylvania and still had business and transferred within the limited corp. So I was still working then. And that was 2005. Mm -hmm. And I would believe it was around 2006 that I finally went full time with Momental. So it was about four years that I was working. Awesome. Yeah. So, and that's, Both. that's encouraging, I'm sure to many listeners because, uh, yeah, I mean, I had that, I had the experience of one day I'm working a full job, full time job. And then the next day I'm like, no. Four week notice, I'm done. I don't have any, I don't know how this is going to work out, but I'm just going to dive in. Mm -hmm. And then others, that's not their story at all. And yeah. they can't relate to that. And so it's encouraging to know that you can do that steady, slow growth. And you know what I love most about that is be, is that it's intentional. I'm sure mm -hmm. through those years, it's, of course, it's hard to sum it all up in four minutes, but um, through those years, <coughs> you have, you learn so much and you now can, however many years it's been, 
uh, math on top of my head, 14 years, right? Uh, it's You can probably sit back and think, yeah, this is the company that I can feel good about mm-hmm. because it wasn't super fast. It wasn't overnight, mm-hmm. uh, which is which is great. Okay, so so tell me about – take me back to your very first client. You said you, you built your own website yeah. and all of that, mm-hmm. and you had this vision mm-hmm. locally. You want to be – you want to be doing this thing locally mm-hmm. and be well-known for it locally. Mm-hmm. Uh, how did you get that first client? What did that look like? Mm-hmm. Well – there, in my mind, I have two first clients in a strange way. So my very, very first client was word of mouth. Mm-hmm. She was local. She had heard from a friend of a friend of a friend. And like literally I schlepped it to her house with like a bag full of stuff. And, you know, like thinking of doing that now is just like, what? Um, <laughs> so that was my first like real client, mm-hmm. paying client. Um, and that was purely word of mouth. Mm-hmm. And which for me was great because I'm even now, like I'm super shy. I'm a shy person. Um, I could talk to a room of 400 before I want to talk one-on-one. It mm-hmm. freaks me out. Um, now my first client through the website though, that one for me was like the holy cow moment because like it was a girl in California and she wanted daisies painted on her invitations and she was, she trusted me, you know? And so what I used to do before, well, Yeah, what I used to do um, (laughs) to get work. And I think this is something that really needs to be said in in the climate now, the new generation. Mm -hmm. I won't use the M word, I promise. (laughs) But I think it needs to be said that you need to go above and beyond in the beginning. You need to go the extra mile. You need to um, maybe take work that isn't your ideal. Um, and you need to give more of yourself than you're really being paid for, is my opinion. You need to do that for a little while. Mm-hmm. It is, it teaches you everything. And so going back to the, the story of the daisies in California and that bride, um, she trusted me because the first thing I did when she emailed me is I whipped up a sample for her. I didn't ask for money. I whipped up a sample. I photographed it and I blew her mind. She was like, what? What is this? I didn't pay you anything. And immediately she PayPal'd me money and she was my client. And it's so funny, you know, we did her order and we did everything. We did invites, we did day of stuff. She was so thrilled. And I made, I mean, I lost money on that order because I spent so much time. I was so worried and I was so, but at the end of it all, and she is the first and only client to ever do this. She tipped me. She tipped me $150. And I'll never yeah. forget that. And I love the fact that she's actually the only one that's ever tipped me because it just, it proves how important and how strong of a bond trust can make between you and a client. And I built that trust because I put myself out there and I didn't care about the bottom line at that point. So do I answer the question? You totally okay. answered the question, how you got that first client. And, uh, you know, we've we've been through season one. There's been 10 interviews so far. And I, I, don't, I haven't done the math yet, but a great majority of us that are, that are building these businesses, we start out through word of mouth, mm-hmm. through literal yeah. feet on the ground, mm-hmm. just – even though we're scared, because I'm sure it was not easy for you oh to start telling people that, hey, um, I, you know, I did my wedding invitations and I'm kind of good at it. And I, I think I'm kind of good at it and I don't really know, but I'd love yeah. to do this more. You know, it's yeah. a, it's a really scary place to be. So, uh, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to even get that word of mouth going, but right. so often that is how we get our first few clients. Absolutely. And then... And then moving on to getting it out in the world. And I love that you pulled pulled out that experience of there was just this stranger one day yeah. that trusted me mm-hmm. enough to hire me. Yeah. And then it validated that whole process. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's That's encouraging. So now tell me, you know, fast forward, I'm sure you've gone through all sorts of 
ways to get new clients and yes. ways that you kind of regret and then ways that kind of surprised <laughs> you. We've all been through that. Yeah. Uh, but tell me what's working right now. What do you do right now to get the word out about what you do? Uh, well, that is that, that's definitely a compound question because mm-hmm. I think we all know there's a million things that we can be doing right now today at this moment um, to, to kind of speak of our businesses out in the world. Um, I think, so something that I've started, and this could kind of segue into the whole authorship thing, but, um, I've done it all I've done, and I still do. I, I do, um, every year I choose a couple different, um, blogs. Mm-hmm. I, you know, become part of their directories or I do a sponsored post just, you know, I just like to dabble with that kind of stuff and see what works. And, mm-hmm. and honestly, they all have value. They really do. And I'm not just saying that because I do a lot of editorial and I want them to pick me up. I'm not just saying that. <laughs> <laughs> like they really do. The blogs yeah. out there are working their butts off to make sure that, you know, the vendor listings are really a return on our investment. So I love that. I do mm-hmm. love that. Um, there have been certain things, um, again, without naming, you know, there have been big directories that are more regionally based that don't work for me and that I learned that, um, you know, the big, big ones that, you know, if they're, you you have to figure out, is your business, your bread and butter regional or is it global? Mm -hmm. And for me, it's global. So they don't work for me. Um, Mm -hmm. I've done, you know, magazine spreads that, that can be amazing. They always would return investment, even though, you know, plunking down a couple thousand dollars is always scary, Mm -hmm. but they always return on their investment. They just do. Um, but right now what I love most of course is Instagram. Well, I have a love hate relationship with it. Just did a shoot yesterday with a bunch of gals. Um, and we had like a complaint session about Instagram <laughs> and like, and then what's this, the shadowing thing, this hashtag, I was, what, what the heck is that? I don't even understand. But anyway, I love Instagram. I love Instagram and I love um, developing content that is immediate. It's, it's, it's in the moment and it's real. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes I'm planning content weeks out, but then there are days where I do something and I just put it out there and somebody responds to it and I get an email and I book a client. You know what I mean? So I love the immediacy of Instagram, Mm -hmm. um, so much. So Instagram is huge. Okay. That's, that's great. Uh, so tell me how the, the publishing of books plays into this whole story. Sure. Absolutely. So, um, going back to like 2009, I planned two shoots. I kept seeing everybody do these style shoots and I'm like, well, I can do that. I'm not a planner, but I'm an artist. I am very visual and I used to do visual merchandising. I can do this. So I wanted to do it and I did. Mm -hmm. And let's fast forward like five years. I kept doing them. And getting, you know, submitting them and getting them featured. And it turned into a real, like, grassroots kind of advertising for me. So Mm -hmm. I had all these editorials under my belt. I mean, I even, I started traveling. If I'd go on a trip, like, my husband and I went to Italy in 2014 for three weeks. I did a shoot. I'm like, well, I'm going to do a shoot. I'm there. It was in Destination I Do. It was on the cover. So it turned into advertising for me. But then it turned into a book. Mm. Hi, baby. <laughs> That's my little boy. He's very excited to see me. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's all good. <laughs> um, so uh, the the book that I started designing, The Painter's Wedding, which we just revealed the cover yesterday, was kind of a, um, it documented all the shoots that I've done in the past eight years. Um, so it's all, it's all about staying relevant. And if you have relevancy, you have people's ears and eyes. And that is, I think, what writing the books are about, doing the editorial is about. My other collection, I have two different collections of watercoloring books where I kind of teach people how to watercolor. And they're kind of like coloring books, but for watercolor, but with a lot of instruction in them. And that, too, is for people, even though that's fine art based and not necessarily wedding based, Mm -hmm. that gives people the confidence and the reassurance to know that I'm actually practicing my craft and I know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And it all leads back to trust. All of it. It all leads back to trust. And so that's why that's why I do editorials. That's why I wanted to write books. Because trust me, you're not going to make a fortune writing books. You're just not. I don't care who you are unless you're like Stephen King. 
<laughs> he's rich from books, okay? <laughs> but like seriously, you're not going to get rich, but you're going to you're going to get people's trust because people know, wow, to write a book is hard. It's a lot of work and you, you know, someone's not going to just do it just because they woke up one day and wanted to write a book. They're right. doing it because they know what they're doing. And so it all goes back to trust and visibility and remaining relevant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's how marketing works. Mm-hmm. So they have to know about you. Mm-hmm. Then they have to like you. Mm-hmm. Right. Which yes. probably in your case, I'm just guessing probably just comes from your overall visual vibe. Some people are going to absolutely love it mm-hmm. and totally dig it. Yeah. And then some people just aren't right. Okay. That's absolutely. great. So they can, so they can know if they like you mm-hmm. or not. And then You've been saying it over and over, and I'm so glad because that is the key. I, I have to be honest. Like if, if I had to if I had to dumb down, not dumb down, but really narrow down exactly where marketing is taken from, okay, it's happening to wait, it's actually working. Mm-hmm. It's when that trust factor yeah. comes in. And of course you've done that in many, many ways, having over the years had so many clients, I'm sure so many happy people, satisfied people, reviews, help mm-hmm. with trust. But now you're taking it to this content marketing incredible level. I mean, just like out, totally out there. Like this girl is so legit. She has eight books. Eight, eight books. Yeah, that's crazy. Like, come on. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So obviously people are going to want to work with you because yes, she knows what she's doing. So of course it doesn't always like you said, slow and steady. Mm-hmm. When you first started out, you probably now tell me, like, would you ever have thought that you would have written one book when you first started out? No, no. I remember going to. Um, I'm a long time uh, engaged the engaged summits. I'm a. I attend those over and over <laughs> and over again. Um, they're like a second family to me. And I remember going to the first one in 2008. And I promise this relates. And Sylvia Weinstock <laughs> was there. And she was, she, it was like an Oprah moment. She gave everybody a pre-release copy of her Sensational Cakes book. Um, I mm. think that's the title of it. I hope I got that right. <laughs> and I remember like having this glimmer, like, oh my gosh, like a wedding industry person can write a book. But then like it f- flew out of my mm-hmm. head. And so there was a glimmer of something, but I never, never, never dreamed that I could figure out how to do it. And I could figure out, you know, all of it. So, yeah, it's it's just wild. Yeah, you never know what's you never know what's coming. That's that's awesome. Okay, so let's shift gears and talk about the work that you're doing right now. Uh, what where's your focus at? What kind of projects do you have going on? Okay, so let's see. So I've kind of alluded to it. I have a team of nine. So I made a transition, and I promise this relates. I made a transition um, from working in my business to working on my business in 2014. Um, I had been trying to get there for many years before that. um, But finally in 2014, for a variety of reasons, it happened. Um, So my days in the business look very different right now than they used to. Mm -hmm. Uh, My team, um, you know, every year we improve the quality of our projects Uh, We seem to attract the kind of clients that we're really good at servicing, Mm -hmm. that really just work with us and we have excellent chemistry with. Um, You know, we're working on a couple VIP projects right now. They they aren't always around. You know, we've done celebrities, but we don't do them every year. Um, So, you know, the team is just a well-oiled machine. And trust me, we get knocked down still, though. It happens all the time, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. We're always shocked. We're like, how did what? How did we not ever have this happen before? Anyway, um, so the team is just like kicking butt, taking names and doing their thing. They're amazing. But Mm -hmm. what that allows me to do is to work on all of my little side projects. And so um, still editing The Painter's Wedding and working on that. Um, I'm going to be marketing my first two watercoloring books from the Christie's Cutting Garden series right now. Um, getting into licensing my artwork a lot more. Um, what else am I working on? <laughs> um, editing the next two copies, the next two in the series of Christie's Cutting Garden, because there's four. Um, so lots of books launching in the fall and winter. 
Um, and my publisher doesn't know it yet, but I'm working on a couple more book pitches. Because <laughs> I really like writing books. It's really fun. Yeah. Yeah. So a children's book I have in, in my mind and um, kind of a creativity journal type thing. Yeah. Ooh, I like that. Mm-hmm. Creative. Ooh, wow. All of it is, I, I want in on the watercolor thing mm-hmm. and I want, I want in on all of it, but creativity journal. Yeah. I like the sounds of that yeah, a I'm lot. That. Okay. So this is going off a little bit on a tangent, but I'm really interested. To, I have two questions. I'm really interested to know being that you are obviously immensely creative. Mm-hmm. How do you get the work done? Like, how do you sit down and get the work done? Because I know that as creatives, mm. I've, I've heard it. I deal with it all the time. Uh, sometimes it's like big, big ideas. And then actually executing on them is definitely a struggle. So how do you do that? Yeah, I think you're right. There's absolutely no shortage of ideas out there. Mm-hmm. We see it every day from the people we follow on Instagram. You know, people are launching stuff left and right. And just because you're launching something doesn't mean it's actually being executed. (laughs) Let's just be honest. Okay. So I think there's a huge bridge between having that epic idea and actually being able to, um, execute and execute it well. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's hard because as a creative brain, you know, like, like, you know, this past week I was getting ready for a huge shoot and you know, I got a shipment of flowers for the shoot. And all I wanted to do was paint peonies. I didn't want to plan for the shoot. I didn't want to make lists. I don't want to do shot lists. I wanted to paint peonies. But <laughs> I couldn't, you know. So all that being said, I think the really the most important thing to do, and this is something I tell people when I go to engage conferences, you know, when they ask me, like, how do you get stuff done? How do you do it? When you have that idea, you can't just sit on it. You have to. And one thing I do, my stupid apps, my notes app in my phone. Like, I don't have anything fancy, just the one that comes with the phone. I have a brain dump tab. Christie's brain dump. (laughs) The first thing I do when I have an idea is I put it in there. Mm -hmm. And I promise myself on a weekly basis that I go into my brain dump and I actually do something actionable. On those items. It can be small. It can be a phone call. It can be researching something that I don't know that I need to figure out. Um, So I think the big thing is getting it down and then scheduling time to act on your brain dump list. Mm -hmm. It sounds so easy and like, oh, I should just be able to remember to do that. I don't need to schedule that. No, schedule it. And so, you know, and then you can step up from there. If every week for a couple of weeks you're consistently acting on that list, then schedule an hour a week where you're going to dedicate it to one of those items, not just a couple of items and have things scattered everywhere. Um, So I think it's just pure planning and consistency and having, um, you know, just having that wherewithal to, to focus on that list and actually do something about it. Yes. You know? yes. Even if it's just, again, going back to these conferences, we've all been to workshops and conferences. When I come back from them, I have a list of at least 10 things that I promise myself I'm going to act on within two weeks of returning home. Mm. And that has been huge help for me. So you can apply that to your big epic ideas. Mm-hmm. You know, if you have this list of ideas, promise yourself that within two weeks of having your idea, you're going to do a couple of things to propel you forward in that idea. I I like that you're bringing it back on yourself. Sometimes I think, you know, we we want to use Asana and yes, everybody knows I'm a huge proponent for Asana. It just works for my brain. I love it. I love task list. Mm-hmm. Although I'm creative, I'm still type A too. So, you know, it's going to get done in Asana. But uh but there's this underlying personal accountability, mm-hmm. you know, not waiting, not waiting for somebody else to tell you to do it, right? Mm-hmm. We're entrepreneurs. We went out to do this thing on our own, right? So at the end of the day, who do we have to, to uh, answer to? Absolutely. The great thing about that is the answer is ourselves. And the tough part about that is that the answer is ourselves. Yeah. So at the end of the day, we got to hold ourselves accountable. We got to do the work. And that, yes, I'm, I'm so glad. Okay, so my, my other tangent question is, 
you're running a business that is very physical. You have actual mm-hmm. physical products that you're shipping out. So you are not only building a team of nine people, that's hard enough online, finding people all around the country or even the world to fill the positions you need. Mm-hmm. How do you fill the positions mm-hmm. that you need locally? Because, I mean, if you guys don't know this yet, listeners, we kind of live in the middle of nowhere. So <laughs> yeah. so how do you, you know, does it come down to just really good networking? Does it come down to really good training? How have you done that? Yeah. It's, uh, it's definitely training. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, there were years where we had a tremendous amount of turnover just again and again and again, a lot of turnover. Mm -hmm. And the thing is people are going to come in. If you run a creative business and you're hiring, it's super exciting for people, especially if you live in an area where there's not a lot going on creatively. Mm -hmm. Um, people perspective, you know, employees get really excited and they come, and they're ready for their interview, and I mean, I remember once I had a gal that came in for an interview, and I did, I actually ended up hiring her, we love, we love her, she's going to know who she is if she listens to this, but <laughs> she came in, and she was like planning her wedding, and she had a silk screen handkerchief she wanted to show me, and she was just so inspired by Momental, and it was so wonderful, and oh my gosh, and then I hired her, and then she worked for me for years. And she got into the thick of it. And the thick of it is hard and annoying and makes you want to scream. But when you're first bringing in those creative employees, they don't know that. Even if they've been in other creative jobs, they still don't know it. I don't know why they don't know it, but they don't. (laughs) And they get into it. And so at that moment, at that intersection where you've got an employee who's a little bit like starry eyed about what they're doing and they're realizing that there's hard work behind it all and that there's frustration behind it all. You're at a crossroads Mm -hmm. and training and an uplifting at that point, uplifting another soul in this world is so hugely important. So training them, teaching them, let's say teaching, Mm -hmm. teaching them how to problem solve, because even, a, even people my age don't know how to problem solve. Sorry. <laughs> That's <Hi>. fine. <laughs> <laughs> Just a go go clock. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and music. Oh, music awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Day in the life. <laughs> okay. no so teaching, and there's another one that's going to go off too. Okay. <laughs> so teaching people how to strategize and problem solve is huge. And that, that sounds so simple and like, so like, Oh, that should just happen. Um, but that's incredibly difficult. And that can be the difference between an employee that stays with you for five years and one that leaves after six months. If you don't empower them and give them the tools to strategize in a new business that's constantly growing and changing, they're going to be out the door screaming and terrified of what's happening. You know, I've had employees with us who were there with us and still are, but they were there with us through the crazy times where things were just falling apart around us every moment because we were building something completely new. There wasn't benchmarking research to help us. There weren't other people hand-painting invitations exclusively. Mm -hmm. There weren't other people giving the level of service that we were giving at the price point we were giving it. So we were figuring out process and pricing and strategy, and it sucked. It was hard. <laughs> and so, like, I could have lost a lot of those people during that time, but I kept them excited and motivated about what they were doing and what they were building and that it was new and no one else was doing it. And that kept them going. And that, again, goes with morale and just treating your employees well, um, helping them experience kind of the, the thrills that you experience as a, an owner let them experience those thrills and ups too. Mm-hmm. So, absolutely, yes, absolutely. Uh, I w- I would think that it would be difficult, and I think that that would probably be uh, a hurdle that would be scary to overcome, especially if you're not coming from an overly creative, um, s- you know, town or, or place mm-hmm. or city or, or or wherever you're at. You know, don't let it hold you back. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, honestly, if you knew, if you know anything about where we live, like you could have easily let that 
let that hold held you back like hold you back way back then um and and but you didn't and then that's how you were able to grow it to where you're at now where you're saying like now I have the support behind me so I can go do my fun little side projects and Mm -hmm. see where it leads so that's that's encouraging I think for everybody it's also and it's not even and not to criticize what you said it's not just about letting yourself be able to do the fun little projects. That's part of it, and that's Mm -hmm. cool, and that's a perk of being a business owner. But one thing I learned, and I learned it the hard way, is that, you know, from 2003 to 2014, I was like a flamingo with my head in the sand. You Mm. know, I was working in my business. Do flamingos put their head in the sand or is that no ostriches? I don't know. I don't know, but I get it. (laughs) I had my head in the sand um, because I was working in my business so much I couldn't see. I couldn't see the big picture stuff. Mm. You know, I couldn't see like in 2013, we had the biggest client ever, probably that we will ever have. And I'm fine saying that we worked with Sean Parker on his big sir, $10 million wedding. We did everything for him for paper and all that. Um, and I only say that number just so people understand the scope of it. I'm not saying that for any other reason. I had my head in the sand. I was so focused on that project I was so worried about making sure I didn't lose money on that project because the big projects are the easy ones to lose money on. Mm -hmm. Um, And that project ended in June of that year. My fall fell apart. Mm. I, my business in that, that fall of that year was horrific, horrific because I was trying to do everything, even though I had a team behind me, I was trying to do everything and I neglected building my fall roster. So it's a perfect example of how um, fostering a team is not only important so you can actually live and have a full life, but it's important for the health of your business on a big picture level. Yes. Amen. Thank you so much for clarifying that. I Oh, it's so good. Okay, so I want to lighten things up a little bit and ask you just some quick, easy questions. Okay. Okay, so first of all, what's your absolute favorite business tool that you're using right now? <laughs> Silence. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is going to be so ridiculous, but it is my favorite. Okay, so what I do a lot of videos and time lapses for Instagram there's this little tool that you put on the end of, what are they called? The little bar that goes straight across from your tripod. There's a little tool that you twist in and it holds your iPhone. So you can do the perfect flat lay shot. That's my favorite tool. Ooh, all photographers are understanding this. I know. And I'm like, I so don't... Like, you know, you see people like, <laughs> I'm sure you follow artists on Instagram and they're like painting and it's like the camera's perfectly oh. hovered above their painting. Yes. Yes. And it took me like two years to figure out this setup. But that little tool, you get it on Amazon and you screw it into the little boom bar and perfect setup. Awesome. All right. We're going to have to, we're going to have to link that. And no, that's important because, hey, some of us, yeah. I have three of them. (laughs) I have one here. I have one in my Utah house and I have one at the studio because I love them so much because I can get such great content easily. With that stupid little thing. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so tell me, are you an introvert or an extrovert? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm an introvert. Me too. Yeah. I am. Cool. Uh, mm-hmm. Early bird or night owl? Night owl. Really? Mm-hmm. Ooh, okay. Definitely. All right, tell me, I'm interested to know this one. Where do you, where do you find your flow in your work? where it's really just clicking and hours just fly by and you are just in your zone. Where is that? That's painting. That's, um, you know, during the growing season when stuff's just shooting up out of the ground everywhere (laughs) and I can't pick the flowers quick enough and all I want to do is paint Um, because when I'm like in that zone painting, everything else grows from that. Everything even on the entrepreneurial side grows from that. Um, cause that's my core. So that's, that's my jam. That's my flow. Just painting with the paints and the messy and the brushes in my, in my bun. And that's, that's where it's at. <laughs> that's so fun. Okay. So one last question we've got to end with, I want you to look back 
to 2003 when you're when you're just starting mm. out you're that girl sitting on her couch hunched over her PC because you're not a MacBook user PC, PC trying to figure <laughs> all this out we had that conversation yeah. early uh, <laughs> trying to figure all this out what would you say to her I think the number one thing I would say to her is don't try to do it alone. Um, I truly believed back then that I could be an island. I did. I'm not going to lie. I didn't go to networking groups. I didn't. It wasn't until five years into my business that I realized that was a really, really dumb move. Um, I was out there. I, I knew because of my research, I knew that I was creating something brand new. Mm-hmm. I was creating that whole new market. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that to brag, but no. I really was. There just wasn't anything out there like it. Mm-hmm. So I think I felt very isolated in that, and I felt very alone, and I just sunk into that. Um, and I wish that I had reached out and found a community. Well, help. I cannot imagine a better way to end this interview <laughs> and this season of the podcast, being it's the last one of season one. And that is what we're all about. Mm-hmm. That is the marketing in yoga pants brand community movement. Mm-hmm. That's what it's all about because building a business is so, can be so isolating Absolutely. and connecting with people, whether, whether you're, whether you're really working on stuff or not, just connecting with people that get it, that just get it and, and understand what it's like to be that girl on her couch just trying to figure stuff out. Um, I, I cannot think of a better way to end. So thank you so much for thank that. I really, I really, so that was awesome. not scripted. I it really swear wasn't. it was not scripted. Um, okay, so before we go, can you please tell the listeners where they can find you online? Oh my gosh, okay. So, um, momentaldesigns.com. It's the word moment with an A-L on the end, designs, plural.com. Uh, I made the cardinal sin with my business name because it's easily mispronounced as monumental, but it's momental. Mm. <laughs> uh, Instagram is at momental. Uh, also, I have a, a, an account where I'm somewhat, well, no longer, I was kind of anonymous on this account, but I'm not any longer right now. <laughs> um, it's keep your nose to the grindstone and it's, um, it's a, uh, an account where I just kind of pontificate on my ideas about business and entrepreneurship. And Ooh. I juxtapose that with really pretty artwork. So I get to be really snappy in my words, but pretty in my artwork. Yeah. Um, and there's also Christy the Painter on Instagram. And, of course, there's a Momental Designs Facebook page and Rice Inc. on Twitter. And is there anything else? No, I think that's it. Okay, well, you heard her, girls. Go check her out, send her some love, and then hop into our private Facebook group to hear even more from Christy over the next few days. Yay! Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Marketing in Yoga Pants podcast. Keep the conversation going by visiting marketinginyogapants.com slash Facebook, where you'll get to join that private Facebook group I've been talking so much about. There, you'll get to chat with our podcast guests. Yeah, they're in there too. And all of the other brilliant creative business owners. We're connecting, we're meeting our soul sisters, and we're building our businesses all while in yoga pants. So come hang out with us. Again, visit marketinginyogapants.com slash Facebook to get in. And one more thing. If you dig this podcast, would you be awesome and share it with someone? This entire Marketing in Yoga Pants movement is nothing without its community. So please share. And if you're really feeling the love right now, jump into iTunes. You're probably already there if you're listening to this right now. And leave us a rating and review. The more of those we rack up, the more the podcast will be found by ladies like you and the stronger this community becomes. This episode was edited and produced by the Podcast Engineers. They're pretty great, so go find them at podcastengineers.com. This episode was also brought to you by my online marketing agency, Jam Marketing Group, and you can find us at jammarketinggroup.co. 
That's all for now. Thanks for listening. And I'll catch you back here next week on the Marketing and Yoga Pants podcast. Love you. Bye.